Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our continuing education program. Uh, my name is Scott Perkins, and I'll be your presenter for today's CE. This is a component or a video uh, in our series of uh, the Informed uh, CE Masterclass series, uh, in which we develop continuing education program uh, material from drug information requests that we've received at Informed. Um, so, if this is your first time, joining us welcome and if you've been with us before welcome back uh, we do try to keep a uh, very engaging video format for our ce's so we hope that you find this both informative as well as engaging our ce masterclass um, it, it is like i mentioned developed um, the topics rather are developed from uh, drug information requests that we've received uh, at Informed. Um, and the idea is to kind of get ahead of the game, um, to develop continuing education material on topics that individuals might have before they even ask those questions. And we found that uh, there's about a 40% chance of um, that our Informed drug information database um, has the answer to your question already. Uh, so about 40% of our requests um, are on questions that have already been asked. And so these CE programs are developed to try to get ahead of that curve um, and to give information to individuals before they even have that question. Um, if you have a topic for a CE that you would like for us to uh, cover, uh, feel free to reach out to um, John V. Uh, J-A-N-H-A-V-I at informed.com. Um, we'd love to consider your topic for one of our future CEs. This CE program today was developed uh, in coordination with three individuals, uh, myself, uh, uh, John V as well, and Yutong, uh, all uh, members of Informed, um, helped and worked to develop this CE that we'll be talking about today. Um, John V is the informed brand manager. Um, it's helpful in creating some of our slides, as well as Yutong, uh, who's been within Farm for a while as well, and uh, has been instrumental in developing um, uh, these slides for us today as well. I'll be presenting this material and developing uh, the video uh, that you guys are all watching right now. Before we begin, I do want to announce that neither myself, uh, Dr. Punyarthi, or Dr. Yang have any sort of financial disclosures um, to uh, make note of. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and jump into um, our topic. Uh, today's topic is what does the data say about esketamine for depression? So esketamine approved in 2019. Um, some more data have come out and we'd like to look through the data that are available to figure out where it may fit in terms of uh, treating individuals with depression. Today's learning objectives are to describe the therapeutic characteristics of esketamine, recognize why esketamine may be efficacious in patients with major depressive disorder, describe safety concerns associated with esketamine uh, in patients with major depressive disorder, um, discuss the strengths and the weaknesses of the literature that's available uh, for esketamine or depression, and review the cost effectiveness of using esketamine in major depressive disorder. So with that, let's get on with it. Before we jump into discussing esketamine nasal spray, let's first briefly talk about the therapeutic approach to treatment resistant depression. So it's important to keep in mind that we're not specifically looking at just major depressive disorder, but the, the treatment resistant variety of depression. So when I talk about treatment resistant depression, what I'm talking about is depression that is resistant to at least two trials of antidepressant therapy. So, this is specifically in reference to um, no success with two medications. 
So two medications without success. Now, it's important to keep in mind that when we're talking about our lack of success, what we're talking about is medications where we have maxed out our dose. We have optimized our dose. So we have optimal dose with those medications. So individuals who have tried multiple therapies, two or more, without success. Now, our approach to treatment with these individuals is not exactly straightforward. Uh, there are numerous approaches we can take, uh, such as um, a non-medication approach. So we can go with cognitive behavioral therapy or other forms of psychotherapy as a, um, an augmentation to our current antidepressant therapy. So that's one approach. <clears throat> we can also augment therapy with uh, another uh, medication. So we can go with another medication as well. So adding on additional therapy. Now the other approach that we might take with uh, treatment resistant depression would be to switch to another therapy uh, if needed. But here I want to focus on um, augmentation with an additional therapy because this is what we're going to be focusing on when it comes to the use of esketamine. So other therapies that are potential options would be therapies like uh, lithium is one. So lithium is a potential option. And part of my handwriting here, so lithium. Uh, lithium is often used in bipolar depression, could be used as a potential therapeutic option here for treatment-resistant depression. Uh, we also have therapy with atypical or second-generation antipsychotics that we could try. So I'm going to just put AA here for atypical antipsychotics. Um, and then uh, we could also simply use another antidepressant. Now, the issue with choosing another antidepressant is uh, we, also, we have to worry a lot more about drug-drug interactions with mal inhibitors and the like. So we'll, we'll say another antidepressant. We'll call it AD. So that's another option. Now, in severe cases, um, we might be getting into looking at the use of ketamine or what we'll be talking about today, S-ketamine. And so one of the common trends that you'll see throughout the studies that we discussed today is the patients often included in these studies have more moderate to severe depression. Um, those are our typical candidates where we might think about the use of ketamine or S-ketamine. And that's going to be our major focus. So use of ketamine slash, and we'll just say S-ketamine. Yeah, keep it simple. So this is going to be our major focus for today uh, in terms of treat, uh, uh, pharmacotherapy for treating treatment-resistant depression. Um, so let's jump in and learn a little bit more about esketamine um, and its potential role for treatment-resistant depression. All right, so let's learn a little bit more about esketamine. Esketamine was approved in 2019 under the brand name Spravato. Uh, it has two indications that the FDA has approved it for. So esketamine is indicated in conjunction with an oral antidepressant, so as augmentation therapy, for the treatment of treatment-resistant depression in adults, as well as depressive symptoms in adults with major depressive disorder who have acute suicidal ideation or behavior. Uh, it's also worthwhile to note, and I will stress this throughout the presentation, that esketamine does not have outcomes data for preventing suicide or reducing suicidal ideation or behavior. All the data that we have with intranasal esketamine is for, in this population is for improvement of depressive symptoms. So our MADRS uh, scale, we have some data to suggest that it, it lowers 
those depressive symptoms uh, while not having uh, a specific effect on suicidal ideation or behavior. Esketamine, as you might expect, similar to its racemic uh, version, is an NMDA receptor antagonist. Uh, and when used as an intranasal inhalation, it is used as an antidepressant. It's worthwhile to note that it's believed that since esketamine has a much higher affinity for NMDA receptors than the racemic mixture, that it may have more of an effect on depression, although the exact mechanism of action is not very well understood. Um, as I've mentioned, esketamine is administered intranasally, and there's a, an important caveat to that. Um, so the, the FDA has approved this uh, to be administered under the supervision of a healthcare professional. So while it is an intranasal spray, and yes, the actual patient does it do the administration portion of it. They are required to be monitored and observed after therapy to ensure um, the patient is, is, is safe. Uh, this is especially the case in terms of evaluating patients' blood pressures. Um, as you know, ketamine increases um, uh, blood pressure. And so in patients who have elevated blood pressure or a systolic of 140 or a diastolic of 90 or more, um, we would uh, ensure that, that esketamine is not provided or administered to these patients um, during those circumstances for, at the very least, weigh the risks and benefits. Esketamine is specifically contraindicated in individuals who have a hypersensitivity to esketamine ketamine or any component of the formulation, aneurysmal vascular disease or atriovenous malformation, or individuals with a history of intracranial hemorrhage. Dosing for esketamine is different based off of the indication. For its use in treatment-resistant depression, we have induction and maintenance therapy. Induction therapy starts with 56 milligrams twice weekly and we can increase the dose after that based on the patient's response and how well they tolerate the medication. Um, this can be increased to 84 milligrams twice weekly. After four weeks of therapy, uh, we will want to evaluate the patient for evidence of an actual therapeutic benefit to determine the need for continued treatment with esketamine. If we continue into the maintenance phase, this would begin at week five and we would use a previously established dose, 56 or 84 milligrams, um, and decrease the dosing frequency to once weekly. At week nine and onwards, we would continue the effective dose once weekly or possibly decrease to every two weeks. Again, keep in mind that this medication must be administered in a healthcare setting. Um, so there is a significant burden to have individuals come to a clinic uh, once or even twice a week um, when they're initiating this therapy. For patients who are using this for major depressive disorder with suicidality, uh, they will start with 84 milligrams twice weekly for four weeks, and they may reduce the dose to 56 milligrams twice weekly based on uh, how well they tolerate the medication. After four weeks of therapy, the patient should be evaluated to ensure that the medication is being beneficial and to determine whether or not they would like to continue therapy. Um, any use beyond four weeks for individuals with suicidality has not been evaluated at this point. And I think that's very important to note. In terms of safety, there are some boxed warnings to be aware of. Um, so as this is um, uh, a, um, a form of ketamine, uh, we expect sedation and disassociation to occur in individuals, and that's no different with an intranasal form. Uh, this poses a risk for abuse and misuse, and uh, another reason that we would want to provide this medication um, in a healthcare setting. This medication has um, REMS requirements we would need to be aware of. As with all antidepressant medications, we do have a risk of suicidal thoughts and behaviors. 
uh, for patients who are utilizing this medication. Adverse reactions that were seen in 10% or more of patients um, include cardiovascular side effects. Um, so as you might expect, an increase in blood pressure is expected and patients with elevated blood pressure should be cautioned about using this medication. We also have gastrointestinal side effects. So dysgeusia, nausea, and vomiting are common. And in terms of central nervous system effects, we expect several reactions could potentially occur, including anxiety, uh, dissociative reactions, dizziness, headache, hypothesia, lethargy, sedation, as well as vertigo. As we go throughout the presentation today, keep these side effects in mind. Um, understand that this is not a specifically benign drug um, and use that in conjunction with the evidence that we have to determine whether or not this would be an appropriate medication for the patients that you see. In a 2021 systematic review and meta-analysis that included 24 trials and 1,877 participants, the efficacy and tolerability of racemic ketamine and esketamine were compared for unipolar and bipolar depression. Overall, researchers found that ketamine demonstrated a significant improvement in response and remission rates compared to control. A subgroup analysis was performed comparing ketamine and esketamine. When compared to intranasal esketamine, intravenous ketamine was again observed to demonstrate more significant overall response and remission rates. Additionally, dropouts due to adverse events were significantly lower with ketamine, the relative risk of 0 0.76 versus 1.37. A 2020 post-marketing analysis discussed safety and uh, safety concerns of esketamine based on FDA adverse effect reporting system. Uh, after its 2009 U.S. approval, 962 patients had 2,272 esketamine-related adverse events, with 389 being serious including about 22 deaths. Uh, the most frequently reported adverse events were disassociation, which was reported in 9.32% of patients and had a mean onset time of 20.3 days. Sedation, which occurred in 7.6% of patients and had a mean onset of 19.1 days. Uh, drug ineffectiveness was noted in 5.23% of patients as well. Adverse effects that were less frequent included nausea, vomiting, depression, suicidal ideation, anxiety, increased blood pressure, dizziness, um, dose emission, and feeling abnormal. It's interesting to note that the onset for these adverse, ep adverse events don't appear likely to occur within the first week of therapy. Uh, mean onset times for more common adverse events fell between two and three weeks after initiation. Less common side effects were also noted, uh, and they were no likely to be seen in the first seven days as well. Serious adverse effects were more likely to be seen in patients with certain risk factors. For instance, those taking 84 milligrams compared with the 56 milligram dose, females, patients with higher body weights, patients receiving antidepressant polypharmacy, and concom concomitant use of mood stabilizers, those taking antipsychotics, benzodiazepines, or somatic medications. However, age and the duration of therapy did not significantly confer serious adverse event risk. Based on these findings, the authors concluded that esketamine has a clear potential to cause serious adverse events, requiring further risk-benefit assessment to provide accurate safety evaluations. A report published by the Institute of Clinical and Economic Review in 2019 stated that sufficient evidence is available demonstrating short-term clinical benefits of esketamine taken with background antidepressant 
when compared to simply a background depressant alone. However, the committee expressed concerns regarding study criteria used to define treatment-resistant depression, as well as a lack of long-term safety and efficacy data. The, re the researchers stated that insufficient evidence was available to distinguish between esketamine and ketamine, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, electroconvulsive therapy, or concomitant olanzapine. Esketamine was stated to exceed the commonly acceptable threshold for cost effectiveness of $50,000 to $100,000 per quality adjusted life year gained or per life year gained when compared to background antidepressants alone. The list price for esketamine was reported to be 25 to 50% higher than ICR's value-based benchmark. A cost analysis comparison to ketamine was performed for treatment-resistant depression as well. First year and annual costs with esketamine ranged from $30,000 to about $39,000, while the same assessment with ketamine ranged from $2,500 to $5,300. Ultimately, esketamine was deemed to provide low long-term value relative to its costs. Now let's dive a little bit deeper into several important research studies to learn about the types of patients included in some of these studies and results found by investigators. The first trials that we'll look into are the ASPIRE trials, ASPIRE 1 and ASPIRE 2. Both of these trials are designed the same. A more diverse group of patients from Africa and Asia were included in ASPIRE 1. So I'll discuss their common features uh, by looking through the lens of the ASPIRE 1 trial. ASPIRE 1 was a phase three, double blind, randomized, placebo-controlled, multi-center study that recruited 227 patients. Researchers sought to compare esketamine with standard of care treatment to placebo with standard of care treatment for rapidly reducing major depressive disorder symptoms, including suicidal ideation. Data analysis included 112 patients in the placebo group and 112 patients in the esketamine group. In terms of inclusion criteria, those included in the study were 18 to 64 years of age, diagnosed with major depressive disorder, in clinical need of acute psychiatric hospitalization due to imminent suicide risk, and had a Montgomery Asberg Depression Rating Scale, or MADRS score, greater than 28 prior, prior to the dose given on day one. The MADRS is one of the most common scales used in depression research. It's extremely important to look at the patient population who was excluded from this study, as it's relevant to patients who might commonly present as, imminent suicide, as an imminent suicide risk. First, those with bipolar disorder, regardless of whether it was type 1 or type 2, were excluded. Bipolar disorder presents with a significant risk of suicidality, as do personality disorders, also excluded from these studies, including antisocial personality disorder and borderline personality disorder. Patients with moderate to severe uh, DSM-5 substance or alcohol use disorder six months prior to screening were also excluded from this study. So one of the major points from the ASPIRE trials are that the data really only relate to the use of esketamine in patients with major depressive disorder and whose suicidality is not related to other high-risk conditions. Patients in the ASPIRE trial were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to receive esketamine 80 milligrams or placebo nasal spray twice daily for four weeks each with a comprehensive standard of care that included psychiatric hospitalization and initiation of oral antidepressants as deemed appropriate. Researchers measured the change in the MADRS total score 24 hours after the first dose as their primary endpoint. 
but also evaluated the change in the clinical global impression of severity of suicidality uh, revised score from baseline to 24 hours, as well as safety. Generally, the baseline characteristics were mostly similar between the placebo group and the esketamine group, with a notable difference in the number of female patients in the placebo group. The mean MADRS score was about 41, which depicts significant depression and is far above the 28 points required for inclusion in the study. Thus, the average patient included was severely depressed based on the MADRS score. This is highlighted by the high percentages of patients who attempted suicide within the last month. Importantly, all of the patients were taking at least one medication for their depression at baseline. At the end of 24 hours, the MADRS score from baseline in the esketamine group were significantly improved compared to placebo with a least squares mean difference of a negative 3.8. A similar difference was noted in the Aspire 2 trial with a least squares mean difference of 3.9, favoring the esketamine group. When interpreting the results, it's also valuable to consider that with a baseline MADRS score of about 41, meaning severe depression, the MADRS score reduction seen in the study would mean that the average patient was now classified as moderate, regardless of whether they received placebo or the study drug. Research authors from the ASPIRE-1 trial comment that these findings demonstrate rapid and robust efficacy of esketamine in reducing depressive symptoms in severely ill patients with major depressive disorder who have active suicidal ideation with intent. The researchers who worked on ASPIRE-2 noted that the study reflects rapid and robust reduction of depressive symptoms with esketamine nasal spray in severely ill patients with major depressive disorder who have active suicidal ideation with intent. The next studies we'll discuss are the TRANSFORM-1 and TRANSFORM-2 trials that were published in 2019. Since the design of these trials are the same, I'll be presenting data from TRANSFORM-1. TRANSFORM-1 was a double-blind, multi-center, randomized controlled trial that recruited 346 patients. Researchers sought to compare the efficacy and safety of fixed-dose esketamine nasal spray once or twice weekly, plus a newly initiated oral antidepressant, compared to the active comparator group, which was a newly initiated oral antidepressant therapy plus placebo nasal spray in an adult population with treatment-resistant depression. Those in the esketamine group were given either 56 milligrams of esketamine or 84 milligrams of esketamine nasal spray. Those included in the study were 18 to 64 years of age with recurrent major depressive disorder or single episode of uh, major depressive disorder without psychotic features, and moderate to severe depression, and were found to be unresponsive to an adequate trial of antidepressants. So it's important to note here that we aren't looking at suicidality in the TRANSFORM trials like we were with the ASPIRE trials. Instead, we're focusing on patients who are simply not being controlled with their current or past regimens. That's why you'll see in a moment the study duration is not a short 24-hour turnaround as seen with the ASPIRE trials, but instead a follow-up for up to 24 weeks. Patients in the TRANSFORM-1 trial were randomized one-to-one-to-one -to, -one -to, -one to double-blind nasal spray treatment with either one or two fixed doses of esketamine, 56 or 84 milligrams, or a matching placebo administered twice weekly intranasally for four weeks under the direct supervision at the study site. An open-label antidepressant was added for all patients from four options, 
duloxetine, escitalopram, sertraline, or venlafaxin extended release. And must be one that the patient had not previously received. Oral doses were administered daily for four weeks and titrated as mandated by a predefined protocol. Patients could switch to another oral antidepressant if needed. Researchers followed patients for up to 24 weeks, with their primary outcome being the change in the MADRS total score from day 1 to day 28. Researchers also evaluated the proportion of responders defined as those who experienced a 50% or higher reduction from baseline in the MADRS total score. Baseline characteristics were mostly similar between groups, which notable differences in the number of patients who had previously tried three or more antidepressants was noted. Interestingly, a higher percentage of patients who failed three or more antidepressants were randomized into the 84 milligram esketamine group. Also, you'll notice that the mean MADRS score was lower overall in this study compared to the ASPIRE studies with the baseline MADS, MADRS score being 37 here and about 41 in the ASPIRE trials, though the mean score in both studies still correlated to severe depression. Researchers saw a change in MADRS score in both esketamine groups at 28 days of therapy. In the 56 and 84 milligram groups, MADRS scores were lowered by about 19 where the placebo group was only, only saw a reduction of about 14.8. After performing statistical analysis, a statistically significant change was not identified in the higher dose esketamine group, but was seen in the lower dose group. The response rate, a secondary outcome measure, was also evaluated. Again, this was defined by a 50% reduction in the MADRS total score. In total, 12, 10, and 2 patients saw a reduction of 50% in the MADRS score from baseline. In the 56 and 84 mg esketamine groups and placebo group, respectively. The odds ratio of achieving the response was calculated and was statistically significant in favor of both esketamine groups with a fairly large odds ratio in the 5 to 6 range. Our 95% confidence interval provides us with some critical information in this case. First, as a reminder, since we're dealing with ratio data here, we'll focus on confidence intervals crossing 1 and not 0. For example, if we think about this mathematically, the odds ratio is basically uh, calculated by taking the number of patients who experience a certain event in the study group, in this case, achieving the response rate, um, divided by the number of patients who experience a certain event in the control group. If both groups had 12% of patients achieve this outcome, then 12 divided by 12 is 1. So I say this to illustrate the range of our confidence interval which ranges from 1 to about 60, which is dramatically different, a very large 95% confidence interval. Since the number of responses noted in the study was generally a small percentage, more usage data or a larger study could provide more clarity and narrow down our 95% confidence interval. In this graph, the least squares mean change from baseline is represented on the y-axis and days of therapy are represented on the x-axis. The green line represents the 56 milligram group and the blue line represents the 84 milligram group. The gray line represents the placebo group. Both esketamine groups experienced a fast rate in reduction of the MADRS score when compared to placebo across 28 days. Importantly, however, the graph does not reach a nadir. It's unclear if the MADRS score in the placebo group 
would match those of the esketamine groups eventually, beyond those 28 days. The study authors concluded statistical significance was not achieved for the primary endpoint. Nevertheless, the treatment effect for both esketamine and antidepressant groups exceeded what has been considered clinically meaningful for approved antidepressants versus placebo. Safety was similar between esketamine and new antidepressant groups, and no uh, new dose-related safety concerns were identified. Some important critiques to consider with the study are uh, that similar to the ASPIRE trials, patients with psychiatric conditions were excluded from this study. In addition, the 84 milligram group, which I pointed out earlier on that they technically had the highest failure rate out of all the groups at baseline, uh, this group was not found to produce a significant change in the MADRS score. And so the change in the MADRS score seen with those in the 56 milligram group is perhaps a little questionable as a result, though it could simply be due to the number of patients in the 84 milligram group who failed multiple antidepressant therapies prior to the study. The last study we'll discuss is the SUSTAIN-1 study, not to be confused with the 2016 SUSTAIN trial that evaluated semaglutide and cardiovascular outcomes. So a, a different SUSTAIN study. The SUSTAIN-1 study was a phase three, multicenter, double-blind, randomized controlled trial that recruited 297 patients with the objective being to assess the efficacy of esketamine nasal spray plus an oral antidepressant compared with an oral antidepressant plus placebo nasal spray in delaying the relapse of depression symptoms in patients with treatment-resistant depression in stable remission after induction and optimization of esketamine nasal spray plus an oral antidepressant. Patients with stable remission and stable response were divided among those on esketamine or placebo. Patients included in the study were 18 to 64 years of age, had recurrent or single episode major depressive disorder, a, a score of greater than 34 on the clinician rated uh, inventory of depressive symptomology, a total MADRS score of greater than 28, non responders to at least one but no more than five antidepressants in their, dec in their current depressive episode. Those who were excluded could not have had a history of psychotic disorders, suicidal behavior, homicidal or suicidal ideation or intent diagnosis of major depressive disorder with psychotic features, moderate or severe substance or alcohol use disorder within the past six months as well. So the sustained one study had a similar population to the last study that we discussed as well, where we are not again looking at suicidality. Patients who were not responders to oral antidepressants during the screening phase received esketamine 56 or 84 milligram nasal spray plus a new oral agent for a four weeks of induction and 12 weeks of optimization. After 16 weeks of treatment, the remaining patients who achieved either stable remission or stable response entered the maintenance phase and were randomized one-to-one -one into the withdrawal phase to either continue esketamine nasal spray or discontinue treatment by being switched to a placebo spray along with oral antidepressants. Patients with stable remission or stable response were measured separately for the analysis. The median exposure to intranasal esketamine during the maintenance phase was 17.7 weeks in stable remission patients and 19.4 weeks in stable response patients. The primary outcome measure was the cumulative distribution of time to relapse during the maintenance phase among patients with stable remission. Researchers also evaluated the cumulative distribution and time to relapse among those with a stable response. 
safety was also measured as a secondary outcome. The mean age in the study was 45 years, and similar to other studies, more subjects tended to be female and white. The baseline MADRS score was about 37 in the stable remissions group and about 39 to 40 in the stable response group, indicating a slightly higher percentage of patients had more severe depression in this group. Patients in the stable remissions group tended to have a similar dosing schedule for esketamine with a slight favor to every other week compared to every week. On the other hand, those in the stable response group had a much higher percentage of patients taking weekly doses at baseline. In patients who achieved stable remission, relapse, the primary endpoint, eventually occurred in 26.7% of patients in the esketamine group and 45.3% of patients in the placebo group, a difference that was noted to be statistically significant. And those who had previously achieved a stable response, 25.8% relapsed in the esketamine group and 576 of patients had a relapse in the placebo group. Again, this was considered to be statistically significant. Common adverse events for esketamine-treated patients included transient dysgeusia, vertigo, dissociation, somnolence, and dizziness. Each of the effects were reported in fewer patients treated in the control group. The study authors concluded that continued treatment with esketamine plus nasal spray plus an antidepressant can sustain antidepressant effects among patients with treatment-resistant depression to a greater extent than an oral antidepressant alone. In terms of important limitations for this study, the external validity, meaning the overall generalizability of the study, are limited due to the exclusion criteria, similar to the other studies we've discussed. All right, time for a, a brief reflection, just to have a moment away from uh, the literature that we've discussed. I know that it's quite a bit of, of detail and data. Um, I want you to be thinking about the patients that you see in, in, in your clinics or your hospitals and whether or not they may be um, good candidates for esketamine nasal spray. Um, think about the, the ages of the patients that you often see. Uh, think about any comorbidities that they often have. Um, are these individuals that simply have major depressive disorder solely or are there um, other comorbid psychiatric conditions that they often present with? Um, do they fall into the more moderate or severe depression or do the individuals that you commonly see typically have more minor um, depression? Think about how this medication must be administered. Um, you know, once and sometimes twice weekly, individuals need to present to the clinic um, in order to have this medication administered and for us to monitor those patients to ensure that their blood pressure is fine and that they've tolerated the medication effectively. Uh, so a significant time burden on, on the patient um, and uh, your staff as well. Ultimately, Take just one moment to reflect on the individuals that you see day in and day out that could benefit from the use of esketamine nasal spray to be better able to make a recommendation for it when the time comes or to avoid the use if it's unnecessary. As we're wrapping up, let's take a quick look at some of the overall strengths and limitations of the literature on the use of esketamine. These studies were multinational studies, which included a variety of patient populations and can be valuable to large health institutions with a diverse patient population. Esketamine does pose an increased risk of adverse effects compared to placebo, but it was generally considered safe and efficacious in terms of lowering the MADRS score. 
Intranasal escatamine appears to provide a slight advantage to placebo in reducing depressive symptoms within 24 hours after the first dose in patients with active suicidal ideation. With this in mind, it's vital to know that those using escatamine for major depressive disorder understand that those with nearly any relevant psychological disorder were excluded from the study. This drastically limits the patient population for which we have proven efficacy as those with comorbid psychological conditions may also pose a significant risk for suicidality and may be more challenging to treat. When applying this information to practice, there are a couple of important things to keep in mind. First and foremost, it's important to note that escatamine nasal spray must be administered under the direct supervision of a healthcare provider. This isn't something that patients will be filling at their retail pharmacy and, and taking at home, as careful observation of the patient must be made during and post administration. Escatamine nasal spray is FDA approved for the use in treating uh, treatment resistant depression in combination with an oral antidepressant. Um, and data we have for safety and efficacy indicates potential benefit over the course of one year. As has been reiterated throughout today's presentation, the data here really only apply to patients with major depressive disorder who have no comorbid psychiatric conditions. The FDA has approved this agent for depressive symptoms in adults with major depressive disorder with acute suicidal ideation or behavior. Though the data that we have suggests that individuals in this population, depression and suicidal ideation, there is a reduction in MADRS score. However, we don't have any outcomes data to truly state that the use of Escatamine nasal spray will actually reduce suicidal attempts. Finally, when considering patients who might receive this medication, it's important to note that escatamine nasal spray should be used with caution in anyone over the age of 65 years of age, as there are very few data to suggest its safety in this population. Future research regarding escatamine includes a five year follow up study, the SUSTAIN 4 trial. Uh, which will be completed by the end of 2022 uh, that evaluates escatamine in patients with major depressive disorder. Other directions for research include the possibility of withdrawal, tachyphylaxis, and therapeutic tolerance. Researchers may also evaluate where escatamine nasal spray may best fit for individuals with non-treatment-resistant major depressive disorder Research may evaluate administration in a less restrictive treatment environment or clear identification of response predictors along with safety and tolerability predictors. In closing things up for today's CE, I wanted to end with a brief cost analysis covering several different publications on this topic. First, in 2019, the Institute of Clinical and Economic Review performed a quality of life analysis and ultimately found that the cost of one year of treatment with esketamine exceeded the threshold for cost effectiveness, which is generally between $50,000 to $150,000 per quality adjusted life year gained. Ross and colleagues found that the cost affected more than just the patient and payer, uh, that there was an increased societal uh, healthcare sector cost of about $16,000. Ross goes on to estimate a 95% possibility that esketamine would exceed $150,000 per quality adjusted life year. Finally, Desai and colleagues looked at the expected cost of esketamine and oral antidepressants for 52 weeks, compared to simply an antidepressant and placebo. And the estimated costs in their research favored esketamine. So generally, the cost analyses that have been performed have mixed results. 
When taking quality adjusted life years into account, it appears that esketamine may not provide the benefit to justify the cost in some cases, though more data are sure to come out and clarify specific patient populations or situations that this agent could be used in to really find its niche. So that's all for this month's continuing education program. Thank you so much for joining me and take care.